Sir Kelly, 
always have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Wodin gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, I and of Asia and Africa too, till the peoples thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying peoples held that in their veins ran the blood of those old witches, who, expelled from Scythia, had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools, what devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud, that when the Magyar, the Lombard, the Avar, the Bulgar or the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back? Is it strange that when Arbad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, that the Hon for Glalas was completed there? The Sikelis were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and to us for centuries we was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land. Aye, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard, for as the Turks say, water sleeps and the enemy is sleepless. Who, more gladly than we throughout the four nations, received the bloody sword? or as its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king. When was redeemed that great shame of my nation, the shame of Kassavar, when the flags of the Wallach and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent? Who was it but one of my own race, who, as Voivode crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed, Woe was it that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk, and brought the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula, indeed, who inspired that other of his race, who in a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself. Bah, what good are peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without a brain and heart to conduct it? And when, after the battle of Moax, we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were amongst their leaders for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Sigelis and the Dracula, as their hearts' blood, their brains and their swords, can boast a record that mushroom grows like the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of it dishonourable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. Mem, this diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at cock crow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12th of May let me begin with facts, burr, meagre facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences, which will have to rest on my own observation, or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters, and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books, 
and simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examined in at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that a change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand, and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say, to banking, and another to look after shipping in case local help were needed in a place far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked to explain more fully, so that I might not by any chance mislead him. So he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now here, let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange, that I have sought the services of one so far off from London instead of some one resident there. That my motive was that no local interest might be served, save my wish only, and as one of London residents might, perhaps, have some purpose of himself or friend to serve. I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labours should be only to my interest. Now suppose I, who have much of a furs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle, or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover. Might it not be that it could be with more ease be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency one for the other, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself, is it not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by men of business, who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, he said, and then went on to ask about the means of making consignments, and the forms to be gone through, and of all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available. He suddenly stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to our friend, Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then right now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder, write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much, nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf. It was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is it not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? 
this. It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner, and if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of notepaper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest of foreign post, and looking at them, then at him, and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be more careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes now to write folly to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write shorthand, which would puzzle the Count, if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet, reading a book, whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring, as he wrote them, to some books on his table. Then he took up my two, and placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters, which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances I felt that I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number 7, The Crescent, Whitby. Another her Lutner, Varner. The third was to Coots and Co, London, and the fourth to Heron, Klopstock, and Bill Ruth, Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just had time to resume my book before the count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered he took up the letters on the table, and stamped them carefully, and then turning to me said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. At the door he turned, and after a moment's pause, said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend, nay, let me warn you with all seriousness, that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old, and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now, or ever overcome you, or be like to do, then haste to your own chamber, or to these rooms for your rest will then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then... He finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands, as if he were washing them. I quite understood. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing around me. Later... I endorse the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, I went to my room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though it was to me, as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison, and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my 
Okay. 
changed in any way since I came into it. I could see along the floor in the brilliant moonlight my own footsteps marked where I disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them. They threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time and then whispered together. Two were dark and had high aquiline noses like the Count and great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with their pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. I seem somehow to know her face, and to know it in connection with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at that moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of her voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing, and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain, but it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed such a silvery musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable tingling sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, Go on, you are first, and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out from under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white shark. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed to fasten on my throat. Then she paused, and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and I could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin of my throat began to tingle, as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer, nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat, and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant, another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count, and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with giant's power draw it back, the blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth jumping with rage, and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count, never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hell fire blazed beneath them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were hard like drawn wires. 
the thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him and then motioned to the others, as though he were beating them back. It was the same imperious gesture that I had seen used to the wolves. In a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring in the room, he said, How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him or you'll have to deal with me. The fur girl, with a laugh of ribald coquetry, turned to answer him. You yourself never loved. You never love. On this the other women joined, and such a mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then the Count turned, after looking at my face attentively, and said in a soft whisper, Yes, I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, go. I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight? said one of them with a low laugh, as she pointed to the bag which she had thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there was some living thing within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail, as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round, whilst I was aghast with horror. But as I looked, they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them, and they could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down, unconscious. And that 